Hey, so this is Hiko Simon. I've just spent a week in Dalian in northern China, which is my first time ever really properly in mainland China. Um, and uh, it's been really fascinating and eye-opening. So I just thought I'd share. I know I've been kind of uh, Facebooking and tweeting, which I can do indirectly, but I can't actually access those sites directly, so I can't see the responses on them. But uh, I've, I've been kind of giving my impressions through the week, but I thought it'd be nice here in the airport as I wait to get on my plane back to Japan just to share my impressions of a week in mainland China. So I guess I should start by explaining where I've been for the last week, which is uh, in a city called Dalian. So I, I wasn't in Beijing or Shanghai. I was in Shanghai for a few days on a work conference about two weeks ago. But of course, I was just doing work the whole time. I went out for dinner and I saw a bit of the city. Shanghai is, of course, amazing. 30 million people, uh, a, a culture you know, where people are kind of hungry to make money and earn a living and so on. And you feel that kind of energy vibe. It's like New York. It's, it's like Tokyo times 10, uh, which is a, amazing. But it's a, it's a very special place, a bit like maybe New York is in America or Tokyo is in Japan. And it's um, where I am now is, I don't know if anywhere is typical China, but it's it certainly is more of what you'd call a second tier city. I've kind of come to a conclusion that Dalian is a bit like it within China, like uh, Fukuoka is in Japan. You know, it's a, it's a full city, but it's also grown very rapidly uh, in economy and population. And it's got, a, you know, generally it's got, a, I think, a, a much friendlier, and no, no question actually, compared to Shanghai, it's got a very friendly vibe, very easygoing, but at the same time, the moment that you think and Chinese think of the place as a second tier city, remember it's got double the population of Sydney or, or Osaka or Yokohama. So at the same time, you know, if it wasn't in China, this would be a major world city that I'm in. This is like a, you know, a, a, a San, a Los Angeles or, a, you know, it's a, this is a major world city size, but it's just because it's within China and it's the 20th largest city here. Nobody really knows about it. So. For me, you know, because of my interest just in this part of the world, um, you know, Dalian's got a fascinating history. Of course, all of China, uh, I've never really uh, learned very well about the history of how all the different colonial powers, how France and Germany and Britain and Russia, and everyone kind of took chunks of China through the 19th century, and pretty much everyone just had their way with it, right? You know, China was pretty abused, and this is part of the problem modern China has with the Western world was just this history that we've had of really kind of taking very much advantage of them in the 19th century. But of course, the side effects of that that we know about are cities like Hong Kong, which of course became a British possession uh, for the purpose of selling opium and addicting the Chinese population as a way of making money for the British to have wars in other parts of the world, of course. But, you know, as a result, Hong Kong became British. And I think most people in the British Empire think, well, lucky them, they got to be in the British Empire. Um, so Dalian, it's funny because Dalian has, has got a lot in common with Hong Kong from some perspectives. So Dalian, basically, it's a as a, as a port for shipping and for navy and so on. And, and because of its location, uh, kind of right in between Korea and, and where Beijing is in, chi in China, it's apparently the the best deep water port. You know, it never freezes over in North Asia. So Russia had an interest in it because Vladivostok gets. Uh, gets iced over at times. So Britain, you know, during their various wars and abuse of China, took possession of Dalian, or at that time it was, uh, port, they called it Port Arthur. They established a city here where there wasn't one before, around a port at the end of the peninsula, the only peninsula where this is. And then the Russians came in, I think, that was in 1850 and 1870s, the Russians came in and they, they established a port here for themselves. And this was Russia's main Pacific port, actually. Um, for uh, about 30 years until basically until uh, they lost the uh, Russo-Japanese war where the Japanese kind of forced the Russians to hand Dalian over. Um, I think first of all Japan leased it from Russia and then they leased it from Manchuria um, or it was a Manchurian lease they called it so they, they, they leased it from the Chinese government. So what's interesting is that even when Northeast Asia got a bit weird and of course there was Manchuria which was you know protectorate of Japan Dalian was actually kept separate from that it was actually treated as part of metropolitan Japan you know 
maybe you could say the same as Hong Kong, but even more so than Hong Kong, because at least people in Dalian, Dalian were Japanese citizens for that time. So there's a 40 year history between 1905 and 1945 that Dalian was Japan's Hong Kong. It was Japan's Chinese city that was part of uh, metropolitan Japan. But unlike Hong Kong, where Hong Kongers were not allowed to be actual, you know, full British citizens, they couldn't vote in British elections or whatever, Dalian was actually fully part of, integrated into Japan, in the same way at the time that Taiwan and Korea and Sakhalin and uh, Okinawa all were, as they were all integrated after the 19th century. So what it means is that you've got a city that was first, the port was established by the British. The city was really built up by the Russians, and there's still a lot of Russian architecture around here. But then the Japanese used uh, Dalian pretty much as the entry point to all of its economic activity in China, which was extensive. I mean, there was a time in the 1930s that, you know, Japan's economy made more money out of the Manchurian Railway and uh, from the, its economic development in Manchuria than it did in Japan. And all of that money and all of that trade was focused through Dalian. So, for example, you go around Dalian, uh, if you live in Tokyo, you know the, 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 the Todai building has this particular shape. It used to be the Japanese Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in Dalian is uh, the exact same design, same size. Uh, Ueno train station, uh, the, the main train station in Dalian is modeled after Ueno. It looks exactly the same. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, colonial period buildings, which in spite of being Japanese, you think that maybe the, the Chinese or the communists might have torn them all down, but actually they preserved them. They even have plaques on them commemorating that this was built by the Russians, this was built by the Japanese, and they actually protect these as heritage buildings, and they still use them today. So, and it really reflects back on a time when, you know, what, five or six, ten percent of the Japanese population moved to, they actually immigrated to live in China and lived in China with Chinese people, not in separate areas. They, you know, my old homestay family, the parents were born in Dalian, actually, and they went to Chinese kindergarten, they learned Chinese songs. So, you know, they went with Chinese kids. They were actually fully mixed. And although, of course, a lot of people talk about the negatives of the colonial period, which, of course, I mean, colonialism is now recognized as, a, as an evil that shouldn't have happened by Britain or Japan or anyone. But the, there is an interesting, it must have been a fascinating time between the late 19th century and the, you know, at least up to World War II, where there was just amazing interaction. This city was a, was a really cosmopolitan city, shared by Russians, by Japanese, and by Chinese all mixing and living together totally normally. And when you think about how, whether you just call it xenophobic or anti-immigration it is today and how, you know, cautious Japanese are about Chinese, just to think, there was a time when, you know, Japan absorbed and integrated Taiwanese, Manchurian, or Dalian people into Japan. This is kind of fascinating to me. It shows that there was a, there was a time, a very brief time in Japanese history. <laughs> Announcements. I got this mic, so hopefully this is helping. But there was a time in Japanese history, at least, where Jap Japan was very outward looking. And, uh, uh, well, that's not my flight, so I'm okay. <laughs> but there was a time, anyway, when, uh, <laughs> I'm going to post this anyway. I'm sorry about the announcement. Oh, there's going to be Japanese next. There's three languages for everything, so it takes so much time. But anyway, there was a time when Japanese were, you think of how close-minded and how island mentality Japan is now. But there was a time, and you can see it in Dalian, that the commitment that they made to that city was genuine, it was real. You know, that they really invested a lot of the Japanese economy, and a lot of people made their life commitments to moving in and living in China. And not just to create like a South Africa within China, where Jap with Japanese enclaves that didn't interact with Chinese, but genuinely to learn Chinese and live with Chinese and, and kind of share economic development with Chinese people. There are a lot of bad people, of course, and a lot of terrible things happen. And of course, you know, we all know about the World War II and the things that happen around here. And that stuff is, of course, very well known. But at the same time, it is kind of nice to see that this is a city where there are people that still commemorate, you know, the positives, the development that uh, the Japanese gave here and the interaction that used to happen. And that's, of course, part of the big reason for that is Dalian is now the main city where the Japanese people when you come to invest or start a business in China, this is where you start. This is where, um, you know, you know they, they say now, it's pretty common now, you don't go straight to Beijing or Shanghai, you invest in Dalian first. And if any Japanese business has a chance of getting off the ground, this is probably the most Japan-friendly city in China. And this is where, you know, at the airport, all, half the flights are to Japan, Japanese businessmen everywhere where I work, everyone is Japanese speaking, they push Japanese and English education. Um, 
Yeah, and this is still a very internationally minded and a very economically booming city because of its interaction with other countries. So again, there's this image as well, not only that Japan is closed, but you know, that China's become so closed. But perhaps this is a, a very open city. So yeah, the history thing is fascinating, the size and the scale, just the fact that, you know, you see public housing in Japan, it's like six stories or seven stories, and there might be blocks in Saitama or Hachioji. But here, you know, the city's very compact, so right in the city, you can see, I, I'm looking up from the airport, I can see dozens, I mean, more than I can count, of these apartment blocks, and they are all like 30 or 40 stories high, they're just packed full of people. So it's amazing to me. And you see, well, where are all these people? This is too many people to think about. So I'm, I, I was working in an outsourcing center and a software programming center for offshore development. And the offices there are just packed full of people. But all the people there, they drive Western cars. They're paid quite well. They've all got iPhones. Um, they're all dressed nicely. They're all very smart, well-educated. You, you talk with them in the different teams. They're very bright, very worldly, very knowledgeable. And there are tens of thousands of these people in this uh, special development zone that I was in. Um, you know, it's not a sweatshop. <laughs> it's not. This place is, you know, this is, when I go out to lunch, lunch costs close to $10 for lunch in the area immediately around the software development zone, which is expensive for China. But, you know, it's the same as Japan. Even when we go for cheaper food, you know, you still pay. The prices, the cost of living here, and actually people are telling me, the salaries are cheap, but the cost of living is high and it's unbalanced, which is a problem for people who live here just because it's growing so fast. But cost of living and everything and standards of living are very close. Um, the city, it's, it's, it's amazing, the, the cars, probably Chinese-made cars are fewer than half the cars, which is a sign of the wealth of the city. Um, but yeah, just a really cool vibe, really fascinating city. So that's the city of Dalian. In terms of uh, the other th things, I've got some notes which I just made and want to cover. The internet stuff has been a you know, real drag as it was in Shanghai. They'd be here for a whole week. No YouTube, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no SoundCloud, no Gmail. So I can see the notifications. I can see that I've got like 90 something unread Facebook messages and everything. Um, and I can indirectly, I can use sites like Buffer or uh, I can use my RSS setup that I can send tweets but I can't read the feedback back, except in the little notification messages, but I can't open the apps. So I was joking the other day, it's a bit like being in a digital Betty Ford clinic. That's kind of crazy. But, jeez, uh, the announcements are really loud. Let me see if I can bring this closer. Um, that said, the Chinese are all on iPhones and smartphones. They're all using their own Facebooks and their own Twitters and their own YouTubes. It's just that they're different sites. Um, and it does kind of show, you know, maybe, you know, Microsoft kind of sold out cooperating with Chinese authorities here to do that. But uh, perhaps Microsoft was right. You have to think when you're missing out on a market this big, you know, you wonder, I mean, I, I've always admired Google's principled stand on not doing business here um, for the various reasons that happened. But at the same time, it is a huge, who's winning and who's losing? You never really thought of Google losing by not doing business in China, but you come here and you realize, yeah, maybe they are. Um, so, you know, again, you just come here and you see the wealth and the affluence and the sophistication and the size of the market here. You know, it really is something to behold. And this is even in a city like Dalian, which isn't, you know, a, even a top ranked city here. Um, I'll talk about some other stereotypes before I came here. You know, if China makes the news, let's face it, in China, there was wonderful news today. is isn't something that you really read or hear very often, or in any country, frankly. You know, the only news, we always complain in Japan about weird news being the news in, in America and trying to correct that. Um, a lot of Chinese people here, particularly Chinese people who have been permanent residents or lived in Japan more than 10 years, talk to me a lot about how um, they get very frustrated how Japanese or Western news of China is always only the weird stuff or only the negative stuff and how misleading it is because the country is so huge and there's so much going on in the Western media only picks up you know the bad stories which i guess is something you can complain about anywhere but again like japan because china is kind of walled off from everywhere else it's very easy to do it's very lazy to do but it's very easy to do and it's very frustrating for chinese people but at the same time you only have the information that you have so before i came here of course all the stereotypes and expectations i had have been shaped by the media coverage of china that i had until then so what were the stereotypes that i had 
first and foremost, that the food is unsafe. Whenever you hear a story about China involving food, it's a safety scandal. That, you know, people died or they mixed in plastic rice with real rice or they mixed in, you know, industrial chemicals with milk or the, they used fake oil or, you know, they, uh, or, the, or the chicken McNuggets were made in unsafe, you know, san unsanitary conditions. Or... So you do form an impression, and my wife kind of told me, don't eat anything outside of the hotel. <laughs> Or don't, you know, don't drink the water, don't go out, eat any street food, don't do anything there. And I, of course, was thinking the same thing, but of course you arrive and there's six million people and they're all eating the food and perhaps, yeah, sure, maybe they've got a bit higher tolerance. And I, I was afraid, I was concerned. The first day, the very first day, I ate some street food. I ate some kind of um, shish kebab, lamb and stuff, and it was extremely spicy. It was covered in chili powder. And I was like... And actually, I, I didn't feel great afterwards. I thought, oh crap, and the taste wasn't that good. Honestly, I kind of thought, well, maybe this is going to be a really tough week. But pretty much everything from the second day, yeah, the food is super oily. It's just Chinese food that uses a lot of oil. And you do have the consequences of eating any food that has a lot of oil in it. But the food all tasted great. I didn't really get diarrhea once, which is funny. Even my Chinese co-workers were saying, bring diarrhea tablets. And every morning they'd say to me, hey, Hiko, did you get diarrhea from the dinner last night? It's like a greeting, they ask you, do you have diarrhea? But I, nothing substantial to report. It was actually, you know, I mean, no question, it's oily food and it affects you like oily food, but not like it'll make you sick, oily food. And actually, the food isn't like Chinese food that I've had in New Zealand or Australia or Japan or anywhere else, actually. It's not the typical fried rice and, uh, you know, chow mein or whatever that you see in, you know, American stuff. But the food here, it's all kind of new, new to me. Some of it's kind of familiar, but. Man, I, I've had like uh, the shumai, the boiled wontons, the, you know, the nikumans, I've had noodles, I've had um, kind of like shabu shabu, like hot pot, hot pot and all this sort of stuff. This is food which you worry can give you food poisoning and stuff like that. I've had food poisoning from hot pot in Japan. It was great. It tasted great. Had great times going out, really fun nights out with the people and the food tasted excellent and I've been fine. So. It makes you realize that, you know, although you might hear a news story about food safety somewhere in China, China is a country of a billion people and that's one incident in one place that you hear a couple of times a year. You know, everybody, all the other billion people are eating normal food and getting on with their lives and they're fine, which makes you realize it gives you a real twisted view of what food safety here kind of is, which isn't to say you shouldn't be careful, even though Chinese people are afraid and they are careful. But, um, you know, they do have concern about food safety and they read the same news. But at the same time, to think that that defines the whole country, yeah, of course, I, I had an overblown idea about the food safety issue. Another idea, of course, is uh, bad driving, which, of course, I've seen everywhere. And it's interesting, the, the driving isn't what I'd consider to be good, but at the same time, the cutting in, the, you know, the, the walking through traffic and all that sort of stuff, which is normal here, everyone's just laid back about it. Someone cuts in in New Zealand, you know, or in America, someone might pull out a weapon or go and assault the guy, or, you know, it, it turns super aggro, you get road rage about that sort of thing. Here, people just drive that way, and if someone cuts in, you just hit the brake, everyone's just relaxed, you never see anyone getting really hot-headed. I mean, I never saw an accident the entire week. I saw driving that I would expect to cause accidents the entire time. Crazy traffic jams, lots of cars, there's no train system really to speak of in Dalian. They're just building its first subway. So the traffic is a real problem here. Well, we, I got used to walking through the traffic and how to weave through, you know, moving cars. The cars kind of give way. They don't stop, but they kind of give way. Cars kind of give way to each other. Everyone just kind of is easy going about it. And it's not, it's not what I would consider to be good or orderly driving, but it, it works. So it's not as dangerous. I thought the driving might be dangerous, but it wasn't. Um, police state. I had an idea that this would be a highly monitored, highly, you know, you do have an idea that this is a, country that was 20, 30 years ago, it's like North Korea. And uh, even though we know that's changed, there still is an image that, you know, the, again, a lot of the news stories about activists or protesters or lawyers being arrested all the time, that police watch everything, even foreign tourists recently got arrested. So you get this idea and almost an assumption that I'm going to be spied upon the whole time, that I'm coming to the old Soviet bloc. And while there is a lot of, I guess, public surveillance, there are cameras everywhere here and guards everywhere and so on. Um, it is interesting, even when you talk with people as well, the idea of the fear of the police, the fear of, you know, which I experienced in Eastern Europe a long time ago, the idea of the fear of people informing on you that you were speaking badly about the government or something. Everyone here speaks badly about the government, or at least there's a lot of free conversation about that sort of thing. Um, and you can read the news stories about, you know, in some parts they do have a problem with public order 
because the society here is so individualistic and free. You know, and the police are kind of passive. You see police in police cars, they're on their smartphones, you know, letting everything walk by. They're kind of lazing back or whatever. I just saw in the airport just here, um, a security guard plainly hitting on, or maybe it was a reverse hit on by the, a very attractive Chinese lady talking with a kind of good looking security guard. Yeah, they're hitting on passengers. I've never seen it anywhere. So airport police, you know, hitting on successfully, or even unsuccessfully, but successfully good-looking passengers before. But it's just kind of laid back, you know. I mean, again, you don't want to mess with them. It's like Japan. Japanese police are laid back, but you don't want to, you know, you don't want to try it on with them. No question, maybe more so in China. But the idea that this is a real police state, that stereotype I had, I don't know, maybe it is. You shouldn't presume too much. I, it's still safe to presume here that you are being followed and tracked or something, perhaps, and not do anything stupid in that assumption. But it's not the police state, and it doesn't feel like a police state like I assumed it would feel like. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, it's kind of funny. Another image I had is that Chinese cut in line a lot, uh, which you hear about in Hong Kong and southern China. At least in Dalian, I didn't see much of that. It's funny, the only time I saw that happen was at the airport when I was, there's a huge line for checking in. And this guy kind of wandered in and, and cut directly in front of me. And I was kind of like, what are you cutting in in front of me? But just as I was going to kind of react, I kind of lost this China, I guess people cut in line. I saw the guy pull out his passport. He had a Japanese passport. This was an old Japanese middle-aged guy who, I guess, maybe he figures because he's in China, he can let the rules go. The only time I've been cut in line was a guy in China. So, it was a, it was a Japanese guy. Never had a, any sort of a problem with that here. And again, that might be the local culture. So, you know, most of those stereotypes were kind of blown away for me. So people, got lots of notes on people, but you know, people are super easy going. Oh, yeah, yeah, one real impression here, overwhelming impression is, is that when you, well, I've lived in Japan for 16 years, so I don't consciously think about the fact that everyone's eyes are constantly on each other. I, I've become Japanese myself in the sense, I'm always watching other people, people are watching you and checking your behavior. And there is a kind of, I don't know what you call it, tension or a kind of like, you can't re fully relax in the sense that you're always thinking of what well, is he looking at me am i doing something that's standing out or my wife is watching everyone don't do that you're talking too loud the idea that i'd be shooting a video in front of other people in japan i'd be too self-conscious to do this in an area where there are people around <laughs> i'm doing it here because you know i might get a look but people here they really genuinely don't care and it's kind of funny in tokyo foreigners don't stand out that much but people still just watch each other even if they're japanese if you go to a country, a country area like Fukuoka, for example, on top of Japanese normally watching each other a lot anyway, being a foreigner and the fact that you stand out more, you know, if you look suddenly in one direction, you'll see eyes on you, you know, and people look, look away or something. In Dalian, you don't see many European looking people. There are some Russians and there are some business people here, but you know, the whole week, I've seen less than 10 probably white people. I'm in the airport right now, I've seen one white person, that's it, in the entire international airport. So I'm a, I'm a rare sight here and I'm aware of that and this is a very highly populated crowded city but I'm walking through these crowds and even if like you look around you kind of sometimes there are ways you know to check from Japan if people are watching you people don't give a shit they don't look at you they don't you know they're just doing their own lives you go up into a shop in Japan people panic oh I can't speak English or oh do you need a fork in China they just ni hao ma to you in China you know, they just say hello to you in Chinese they try talking to you there's no expectation that of special treatment or, or, or differentiation, which, I don't know, it just means that you, you're not self-aware of feeling like stress from it when you're in Japan. But when you come to a place like China, particularly a place like Dalian, which is more laid back than Shanghai to begin with anyway, the feeling of freedom that you have of not being, needing to worry about what everyone's watching and thinking all the time, you just feel so relaxed here. It's just amazing. It makes you realize how much, you know, underlying stress that you forget to think about in Japan but you come here and it's gone and it's just really liberating so the big impression there is this Chinese people and Chinese culture just has this thing that they don't really care what you look like or where you are or you know they go about their own business and I don't know it's just it really is it's just friendly and easy going um, you know they do in public things like you know, see people picking their noses or taking their shirts off and stuff which in Japan you'd never be able to get away with and they do that just again because people, I guess, don't point it out so much, which could be interpreted the other way as bad manners or lack of consideration or something. But most of the stuff is stuff which really doesn't have any direct consequence for other people. 
And in that sense, it kind of makes you think, well, you know, why do we care so much about it? I mean, I guess it's this whole we're living in a society thing that in Japan is very strong. But yeah, so anyway, I really laid back. And that's reflected in the traffic, the fact that the traffic is kind of chaotic, but at the same time, it just works because, and it works because you don't have this road rage phenomenon that Britain and New Zealand has a real problem with. Um, politics, I was really surprised. People are open talking with me about politics and with each other. And it's funny, in spite of you expect a taboo about that sort of thing here, you know, Japan has a real taboo against talking religion, politics, or, the, you know, history. In J China, they don't talk about religion, but politics and history, and very open-mindedly talking about, not like you'd expect, like, you know, saying the, the official government line and challenging, like talking very openly and frankly, self-deprecatingly, and taking all sides. Very open and very, you know, you have fascinating discussions with people here that you don't have in Japan, which would make you think just based on the conversations. Political discussion in some ways is more censored in Japan, I think, than in China. I mean, of course, you don't have that much political freedom per se. You know, the, the, the government system is different. But it's funny, they were actually openly comparing the two systems and the pros and cons of each, and they're smart. And they really, of course, these were people that understand Japan very well. But I don't know, I, I've just had more interesting political discussions and very open historical and political discussions this week on pros and cons of both ways with people here this week that I've had in years in Japan. So that was just amazing to me. Yeah, just people here are just very well educated. You know, this idea that China's this closed off country of, you know, people with indoctrinated, brainwashed people. That idea, which was the idea of, you know, the stereotype of China in the 80s and so on, that, that world is gone. You know, the Chinese people are, they're like us. They're in, a, they're in a very different country with a very different history and culture, but they're like us. You know, that's, you, you say it out loud and you say, of course, but it's really hard to think that when you've got no connection and you don't come here, you believe the stereotypes, but you come and you realize, it's like Japan, people are just people and the people here. And it makes you realize that, you know, in probably North Korea as well, when that country opens up, you're going to find out the people there are normal people that have the same opinions and the same, just like here, just like America or anywhere else. So it's a nice reminder. <laughs> I talked a bit about the food before. I do have a little comment here about how China feels like outer space. Just because there's so little transparency going in and you know, the, the idea of coming in and out, I had no idea what to expect coming here. There's not a lot of information. The firewall and the internet stuff, I guess, adds to that perception. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, when you get here, you realize it's just the same as Japan. I mean, I always talk about how Japan feels like outer space, whereas my sister's in the UK and I'm in Japan, but my mum complains sometimes it feels like Japan is further away because she doesn't know anything about Japan. It's hard to visualize what I'm doing, even though I'm physically closer. Um, and maybe it's the same with China. China's close, but it feels far away because people don't really understand it very well. And I guess that's the conclusion that I've come to is that I think what this has really taught me, it's, a, it's reminded me and really demonstrated to me that the solutions for all of the stupid politics and all these conflicts and all this building up in islands and all this sort of stuff, the answer to it really just lies in people exchanges. It lies in coming here and seeing for yourself and the amazing numbers in which Chinese are traveling and coming to Japan is such a good thing for, you know, you talk about the, the changing the law and the boosting the military for safety. Don't boost the military. Send people on package tours. <laughs> That's the way to fix it. That's the way that Chinese will form positive views about Japan and break down the stereotypes that they're told to have by the government. And the same way that the news media in Japan and America tells you to think of China this way. You come for yourself and you see for yourself and you meet Chinese people and you interact with them. And you see, it's not, you know, that that's more, more effective than having an aircraft carrier here, if you ask me. Um, no, I don't know. This is where it's really been really cool for me to have my chance to do that and see that for myself and to feel that myself. And yeah, it's really cool. It's something I really I'm, I'm looking forward to an age in which China continues to be more accessible and which more people have more chances to come here. I, I originally wanted to learn Chinese instead of Japanese. It just there wasn't an opportunity to do it in those days. Now there is. I'm glad I learned Japanese. I've come to like Japan. But, you know, it was um, learning Chinese is a great way to go. And, you know, this is a country full of such possibilities and to think of a world that becomes more integrated with the billion people here and how that will change humanity. You know, I think that's something I think that's feared in much of the Western world. 
I think you come in and you realize it's not. I think it's just, you know, it's just like there are lots of Chinese people who have integrated into American New Zealand culture. They'll integrate into world culture too, and they're already doing that. Maybe they're doing that more than people give them credit for and realize. And that's what's been fascinating about this. So um, that's been 30 minutes of just talking about being here. It's been a fascinating week for me, really eye-opening. I've just loved every minute of it. I've taken a lot of photos. I'm going to post stuff. I went to a North Korean restaurant, which I love, and I'll post a video of that if I haven't posted it already when I post this. Um, and Dalian is just an amazing city a, a, as an entry point for developing an interest in China, just other than Shanghai and you know all that sort of stuff, and, and, and Beijing, other than the obvious things. Yeah, it's really sparked an interest for me more than I got from Shanghai, and I think I'm going to be back um, work, work and other reasons as well. But yeah, I, I had trepidation about coming here, but it was really cool, and I can't wait to come back. So. China, it's awesome. You should come check it out for yourself. That's my impressions anyway. Peace. Boom.